I'm just excited this morning. We've been going through this series on the the non-negotiables of the Church of God. We've talked about Jesus being a subject. We've talked about the supremacy of Scripture. We've talked about the Great Commission and sharing our faith. And it's awesome to see some visitors this morning. That's great. And those online. And this morning we're talking about the Great Commandments. Now I said Great Commandments, not Ten Commandments. There is a thing called the Great Commandments. I had a few people this week say, when I saw the title, they're like, are you sure you're not talking about the Ten Commandments? I'm like, no, we're talking about the Great Commandments. Love God and love others. So I've been married a little over 30 years right now. Can you believe that? I don't even look old enough to be married that long. But I've been married. I've been married a long time. <laughs> I got gray hair. If you, I mean, it's starting to show from a distance, but I'm getting some gray hair over here. But um, I've been with Rami now for almost 30, for over 30 years, and we were, high, we were high school sweethearts who fell in love in high school and started dating and had kids and got married way younger than we should have. We weren't even 18 yet. We were already married and had John and Jessica on the way, and so we've done a lot of growing up together, um, a lot of change and transition, and we've moved from Chicago to Michigan and from Michigan to West Virginia, and we We've been in ministry in a couple of different churches and other ministries, and it's just like, it's, it's been crazy. It's been incredible. Like, and our marriage has experienced all the good, all the bad, all the everything in between, because let me tell you, if you've been married for any more than a couple months or a year, marriage is challenging at times. It's super, it's super rewarding. I wouldn't trade it for anything. I absolutely am in love with my wife today more than I've ever been. Marriage is awesome. It seems like the older we get, the better things get, and So stick with it if you've been married not that long. But I know that if I were to tell Rami I love her, and we say it all the time. You should say it all the time. But if I say I love you, and then I just ignore her, and I I just do what I want, and I don't really ever show her that I love her, if I don't ever try and speak. There's this thing called the love languages. Anybody heard of the five love languages? It's, it's a great book. You should check it out. But everybody kind of has their own love language. There's, there's this own way that you feel loved, and everybody's a little different. My love language is words of affirmation. I, I totally feel loved when somebody just says, like, hey, good job, you know, whatever, just words of affirmation. My wife says gifts of service. Man, she just loves if I vacuum. <laughs> Wash the dishes. If I cook, if I, yeah, girls, guys, you, you never know. You might, your wife might have that love language, and she might totally get excited if you just break out the vacuum cleaner or sweep the floor or do something like that. So my wife loves when I do chores. I always thought that was weird, but it is what it is. <laughs> but we each feel love differently. But love, to be married for this long now, takes a couple of things. One, it takes commitment. You have to be committed to it because you're going to go through good times and bad times and you're going to go through the ups and downs of life. Two, it takes being faithful. You have to be faithful to each other. Trust me, there's there's lots of things to try and get your attention, but you got to be faithful to each other. And love is an action word. Love has to be lived out. It has to be lived out in sacrifice and service, and it, ha- it has to be dedication. And even the word love in the scripture, there's a few different words that mean love, but the main one I'm talking about this morning is agape love. Agape love is a commitment. Yes, there's times in marriage where I'm not feeling it or she's not feeling it, and maybe you're not feeling it this morning, but commitment says never will I leave you and never will I forsake you. I'm going to stick this thing out, and we're going to work through it. And And I want you to know that as we talk about a relationship with God this morning, the scripture uses marriage as an illustration quite a bit because it's like Christ in the church, husband and wife, and so on. So if you're married this morning, you kind of get a little bit like your marriage would not be great if you don't actually put some action into your love, if you actually don't do some things. And and I was I was watching anybody like Jeff Foxworthy, the comedian. And he's like, you might be a redneck if, and he goes on his list of things that you do, redneck type of things, and I'm not going to go through that this morning. You can Google that, watch that on your own, but I think, like, you might not be loving God this morning if, if there's no commitment, if you're unfaithful. If there's no, there's no discipline in your life, you, you, you might say, you might simply say, oh, I, I love God. But see, loving God is today in our culture, love and this idea is like, God is not a big cosmic teddy bear this morning. 
We're like, oh, it's like your care bear or something like that. Like, like we have to remember that even Jesus taught us that when we pray, we have to acknowledge who he is. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Loving God is, starts with acknowledging who he is. And because of who he is, because of how incredibly he is, because of God is love, amen? That's the chief him. But God is also holy, he's righteous, he's just, he's jealous. He's, he's a lot of things the scripture says this morning. And we have to start out with the idea of, of acknowledging who he is because to love God is to love God in a way that's fitting for him. See, the people of old have always had this problem. See, God had always wanted a relationship with people. And yet, if you read the Bible, you see that God is going after relationship, but people often will love and worship him for a minute, and it's usually in obedience, right? But then they often just kind of go backwards, and they're stiff neck and they don't do the right thing. And so we're talking about loving God this morning in a way that puts some action to our love. It's one thing to say, I, I love you, God, but if I love you, God, with no commitment and I'm unfaithful, you, you might not love God if you're not committed to church, if you don't read your Bible, if you don't pray, if, you, if you're checked out during worship or on Sunday morning you're on your smartphone instead of paying attention to the message, or you're talking to the person next to you, or church is just like an afterthought. There's lots of little things this morning that it's like, let's love God well this morning by focusing in on the text, on the scripture. Let's pay attention this morning. I'm going to pray this morning that the Holy Spirit's going to speak to you, right to your heart, that he's going to speak through me. Because we want to love God well, because when we get loving God right, we'll get loving others right. And I will never have a chance, that I will never, I've been married 30 years now, I have never been able to love around me more until I had a relationship with Jesus and learned what love was. And the more I love God, the more I worship God and, and give my life back to him, the greater my love is for my family and the church. If it wasn't for learning to love God well, I would never be able to love you well. So this morning we're talking about loving God well. Let's pray. God, I pray this morning as we talk about loving you. God, I, I love you with all my heart, God. I'm so grateful that you're the kind of God who you hear our prayers, you answer our prayers, you bless us, you care for us, you take care of us. You sent Jesus to die on the cross for us, that you, that you showed us how much you love us by giving us salvation and setting us free from our sins and the, and the trouble that we cause. God, you love us when we're stiff-necked. You love us when we're rebellious. God, you're, you're constantly calling us into a relationship with you. So, God, we want to learn how to love you. God, we want to learn in a way that we surrender our hearts to you and we love you well. Lord, I, God, I praise you this morning. You loved us so much that you gave us your word this morning. That we don't have to just, just try and figure it out, but all we have to do is lean into your word to listen to what you have to say. So God, help us to have ears this morning to listen. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would speak through me this morning, right to the hearts of our people, that we would learn to love God and love others with a passion and a commitment. Lord, I pray that our love would turn into an action in our lives. Lord, I pray that we would be a disciplined people. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 34 says this. This morning, as one of the scribes came up and heard him disputing with one another and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all your heart and with all the understanding, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And Jesus saw that he answered wisely and said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Here we are in Mark chapter 12, and a lawyer comes up to Jesus. Now, a lawyer in Jesus' day was an expert in the law. 
that he, he knew. And they're, and they're really putting Jesus on the spot by asking Jesus, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? What's the greatest commandment? And, and, and he has this discussion with Jesus, right? And as Jesus answered, the most important is this, here, Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, is you should love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus is quoting back to Deuteronomy 6 when God gave the law, and, and God says the greatest of all commandments is this, is that, that God wanted people to love him. That God said you should love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And the, and the lawyer, he's, you know, he's just asking Jesus this. And later, we're going to see a little bit later, that the Pharisees, again, they try and trip Jesus up. But, but here, this scripture was so important to them that, you know, they went and worshiped every day in the temple. And this is a scripture, Deuteronomy 6, this quote that Jesus quoted, this is something they said often. They reminded this of, this is something that would have been front and center in their worship daily. Because they knew that this is what God wanted. This is something they would have wrote on the doorpost of the house. It was something so important to them that their idea of love. But what they had in the Old Testament is the scribes and Pharisees believed that loving God was keeping the law perfectly. And they, and they micromanaged the law in such a way that it became really hard to follow. It became, it became all about my behavior and how good I do. And, and yes, there's a piece of that. There is a piece of obedience to this. But they had forgot the most important part. The loving your neighbor. Jesus brings out the loving your neighbor this morning. God taught the Israelites so much in the Old Testament. He gave them the law to show them just how what purity was, what holiness was, what worship was. Deuteronomy 5. A sinful humanity does not know how to worship a holy God with reverence and awe. So he spelled it out for us. Like, like the first part of loving God this morning is acknowledging who he is. How does it be your name? Do you stop for a second and think about? Who it is we're worshiping this morning? Who is it that we're praying to this morning? And when I read my Bible, I think about this. In the Old Testament, when they entered worship, when they entered worship inappropriately, right? When they entered into the temple un- inappropriately, when they weren't supposed to be there, when they weren't doing the right thing, anybody, wanted, anybody know what happened to them? When, they, when, when somebody went into the Holy of Holies, the, that sacred space, and they weren't supposed to be there, and they weren't worshiping properly, they weren't worshiping with reverence and respect and so on, what happened to them? Anybody know? They what? They died. God takes our worship very seriously. God takes what we think about him very seriously. God cares this morning what you think of him. God wants you to, to remember who he is, that, that God is a holy God. He's a just, he's a righteous. God right now is sitting on the throne in heaven. And according to the book of Revelation we read on Wednesday nights, there's worship taking place right now. All of heaven is worshiping God and he's worshiping the Son and they're around the throne. Holy, holy, holy is the men and women in the Bible who even got a glimpse of God like, like David, like Isaiah, and so on. Most, they, they fell out. They fell on their face, face down to the ground. They were, they were afraid to approach the presence of God. Yet in the church today, we don't have that kind of reverence so much. We, we, we approach God in kind of a, a willy-nilly kind of way, like, ah, oh, just carefree, you know, I'm just come in the church, like, like, I just think, like, loving God, like, a relationship with God, like, God loves you, and he wants to spend time with you, and, and God's given us prayer, right? And prayer is a conversation with God, like, like, it should get us excited that, that God feels loved when we talk to him, but we have to take prayer seriously. We have to take prayer seriously, like, like, I, like, it, it, we can't say, hey, I God, I love you, and then just neglect that, and I have a conversation with them, like, and like, if I'm trying to love my wife, and I don't have a conversation with her, how loved is she going to feel? Like, here is God in heaven, and he loves to answer your prayer this morning. Does that get you excited? Does that get you excited this morning? And God listens to your prayers this morning. And God's like, hey, you know, I, I love this in my life because there's so often you have to get alone with God and loving God starts in a prayer time. This is loving God with all my heart, mind, and soul. That when I get alone with God, that, that you know what? There's been time in my life where, where I went into his presence without respecting him. 
I just run in there. Hey, God, I need, I need, I need. You know, just dumbing all my requests in him. You know what I want to encourage you this morning is to slow down a little bit. Slow down and think about who he is. And then slow down. You know what we sometimes we fail to do? We fail to listen. We fail to just listen. There is a thing in Scripture where loving God is being still and just saying, here I am, God, speak. Here I am, God, speak to my heart. What is it, God, that I need to hear this morning? Do you know that when we open ourselves up to God, that's loving God. When was the last time you sat, you just still, and you said, God, speak? As many men in the Old Testament said, here I am. Here I am, God, speak to me this morning. Loving God with our hearts this morning. The Bible says so much about this. Proverbs 4.23 says, keep your heart without village, because from it flows the springs of life. Exodus 34.14 says, you shall worship no other God before me, for the Lord, his name, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Like our heart this morning, I think this, it's, it's like God wants our love in return to him, but so often our hearts are just, just burdened and just clogged and just, just full of the cares of the world and, and sin and, and, and just things that just make that really difficult. That, that God wants us this morning to not only acknowledge who he is, but then to take our heart and say, okay, God, I, I want to hear from you, but here's my heart, God. Take it. You know, Ezekiel 36 is that God will take your hard heart and remove it, and it'll return a soft heart that's hungry and thirsty for him. We got to love God with our heart, and that starts with being honest about the condition of our heart. What's in my heart this morning? What baggage, what stones, what rocks? Jesus says that our hearts are like gardens. What weeds, what rocks, what, I, what is choking out my love for God that I, that I can't focus on loving him because there's just some stuff that needs to go. Like, and you know what we, we, what we do is, is for some reason, it, it's almost more comfortable at times to be broken than to be healed. Sometimes it's easier on us just to hold on to whatever it is that we're not letting go of because for some reason that just makes us feel a certain way. And what God wants this morning is he wants to love you with Love him with his, your whole heart, which means you got to open it up and say, here it is. Search me, oh God. Know my way. Test me. Show me what's not right in my life. Thank God, like a master gardener. God, I got some weeds in my life. Shame, regret, hurt, whatever it is. God, I got some stones in my life. It's sin. Like we can't love God and be in sin. Like, like God, God, because of his holiness, can have nothing to do with sin. So, so if we're going to love God, we have to get honest about our sin, and we need to be a repentant people. We need to be the kind of people that our hearts break over sin. We say, no more. Loving God is accepting who Jesus is and what he did on the cross and saying, if Jesus went to the cross and died for my sins, and he paid such a price for me, then if I'm going to love him, man, I'm going to do something about the sin in my life. I'm not going to allow things in my heart that don't belong there because God's a jealous God. And you know what? When we put things before God, that's called idolatry, and God takes an issue with idolatry. So what is in your life this morning that is in between your relationship with him, and that fish needs to go? You know what I think a big idol in our lives are is Excuses. Excuses. Especially when it comes to praying and getting in the Bible and sharing our faith and just walking like Jesus. We've made excuses and idolatry in our lives. And that is God wants to set you free. Church, I want you to be praying this morning and say, God, here's my heart. Here's my heart. I know that when I read Ezekiel 36 and God promises to take this heart, and I had a hard heart, and God says, I'm going to take that from you and I'm going to give you a soft heart. How about you? But I, I want that. I want that. I so desperately need that. God says we got to love him with our soul. Our soul is the immaterial part of ourselves. Our soul is the one thing that lives past us. Our soul will never die. Someday your soul is either going to be with the Father in heaven in glory, or it's going to be someplace else that you don't want to be. And we call that hell. 
and your soul is something that you have to care for. You can't neglect it. If you neglect it, you're going to find yourself in trouble someday. Our soul is the one thing we feed, and we feed our soul with prayer. We feed our soul with worship. We feed our soul with God's word. When we get in the word and we listen to God and he speaks to us, we're filling our soul. We fill our soul when we pray. We fill our soul when we serve. We fill our soul when we just choose to be like Jesus. Charles Spurgeon said this, with all your heart means intensely, with all your soul means sincerely, most lovingly, and with all your strength means with all your energy, with every, facility, with every faculty and every possibility of our nature. I got to love God by surrendering my heart, but I kind of care about the condition of my soul this morning. And so many of us, our souls are being choked out by the cares of the world because we care a whole lot more about the things we want or whatever is out there that we think we should have or, or excuse me, whatever. And Jesus says this in Mark 8, 36, for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world if he forfeits his soul? I'm telling you this morning, you're in danger. If your soul is crying out for a relationship with God and you're just like, I can't pray. I can't read my Bible. I can't, I can't make a commitment to church. I can't love my family. I'm going to just excuse. And all. It's like, like, you got to start caring about the condition of your soul. Because someday it's going to stand before God. And you are going to be held accountable for every misspoken word. and every, you, like, you want to keep up for God with your soul wide open. And here it is, God. It's like, like, I want to live in such a way that there's nothing between me and God. So when I say I love him, he knows that I love him. Because you know what Jesus did? Jesus prayed. If I want to know how to love God, I just look at Jesus. What Jesus did? Jesus got alone with the Father. Jesus had the kind of prayer life where he cried out to the Father. Jesus had the kind of life where, where the soul matters so much that when Satan tempted him with the world, he said, not today, Satan, no way, no how, no whatever. I'm honoring God. I can't be unholy and then say, oh, I love you, God. Not if I'm choosing to be unholy. I'm not saying that you mind. Everybody's in the sanctification process. And everybody's working out their salvation. But if I got making some choices in my life that are unholy this morning, you're going to have a tough time convincing God that you love him. What is, in, what is the condition of your soul this morning, church? Is your soul in jeopardy because you've been backsliding or falling away or making excuses? Have you actually, I believe there's people in the church this morning there's people in the church this morning that, that, that you're unconverted. You're unconverted. You, you would say that you follow Jesus, but there's no fruit. There's no proof. You would say that you're a Christ follower, but you know you're not following him. You know that, that what I'm talking about this morning is true, that, you, that your soul is in jeopardy, and because you don't want to look silly going to the altar because everybody's going to judge you and all that kind of nonsense, you, you're just dealing with that. And I want you to know this morning that what God wants more than anything is for you to love him with all your heart and with all your soul, that you honestly open up and get real honest about the sin and the things that are in your life. And you take that to the cross. And what did Jesus say? Take up your cross and deny yourself. Count the cost this morning. You know what? I've counted the cost in my life. I've counted the cost. Jesus is worth everything because this world has nothing to offer me that's going to get me anywhere. So I will take up my cross and deny myself and love God with everything I got because the rewards are incredible. Amen. Because I want to get before him someday and him to be like, what well a... But you know what? We, we got respect issues in the church. Some of us don't even have the basic respect for God to be on time, to be committed, the focus. I'm preaching the word to you this morning, something I prayed about. I know God has given me this message. I believe right now the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart. And sometimes I look on and people are just on their phones and just checked out, not paying attention, talking to the person next to you and all that kind of stuff. I want you to lean in this morning and focus and actually give God your heart this morning and your soul. The third one is our minds. Our minds. Like, 
Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, for what is good and acceptable and perfect. Our minds are a battlefield in this world. I don't know about you, but you just social media, the TV, movies, I mean, everything is just attacking us with unholiness. It's everywhere. We, we, we have a real problem in the church of entertaining ourselves with unholy things and thinking God's okay with that. And we watch movies with, with all kinds of filth and disgusting. I don't know about you, if you notice lately, almost every TV show and movie uses his name in vain. You think that's not, that's not planned? That's not, not an attack from the enemy? You got to watch your mind. The Bible says, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world. Guess what? We're the salt and the light. We are supposed to be different. And you know what? You're supposed to be so different that you look a little weird. Oh, they follow Jesus. They're not like everybody else. They're not partying and drinking and doing silly stuff. They're not drugging and messing. With anything. They're actually loving God. They're actually loving God. It's a thing. He said, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world. Like, like we, we, the world says yes to all kinds of things that God says is unholy and not right. And this has always been a problem. There's idolatry everywhere. And, and the people of God have always had a problem with that. And we need to be aware of that. But we got to not be conformed. How do you renew your mind? How do you renew your mind? The only way our heart, our soul, and our mind are going to be connected with God is to have a really, really serious conviction about getting in the word of God. Because your mind every day is going to think all kinds of thoughts. Your heart thinks things can lead you astray. And the only way for there to be a check and balance, the only way for you to know is to get in the word. The only way for us to have victory against the world and all the things the enemy tries to put on us is to do the very thing Jesus did. Jesus loved God when he looked at the devil and he quoted scripture back. And he stood on the truth and the word of God and had the victory. And it's wonderful that he makes it available to us. I can't tell you this one how burdened I am for this message because some of us, we don't really, we don't know. I see it so often, the the hearts that are full of rocks and weeds, the minds that think things that are not right, the the negative thoughts and the I can't and I don't and all this just nonsense. Like, 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 I want you to renew your mind so much. This is how you love God. You accept what he says about you. Girls, I want you to hear this. Like, like I know the world comes at you and it tries to tell you what beauty is and, and all this kind of influ- influencers. All of us got social media influencers, and these people get paid big dollars to tell you how to think, how to look, how to dress, and how to act, and what music to listen to, and all that kind of stuff. Ain't none of them people going to get you to heaven. I don't care how beautiful they are. I don't care how many millions of dollars they got. I don't care many clubs, concerts, all that extra. Only Jesus Christ can save you. I can listen to all the influencers of the world. Right now, we're getting into a heavy political season, and you put on the news, and you better believe the news is trying to influence you. You got to get in the Word of God because when you spend time with Scripture, that's loving God. And you got to get in the Scripture in such a way that Philippians 4 8 says this finally, brothers, whatever is true. Whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is holy, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. I love God when I get alone with him, the way Jesus did. I love God when I focus on his word. I love God when I sit there silently and say, God, speak to me. And you know what he does? I don't know if you've ever heard the voice of God, but God speaks. He speaks. And when you're in the habit of getting into that secret place with him, and you're praying, and you're listening to him, and you're worshiping him, and and the more you're in his word, God does still speak. There is still a still voice, a small voice, that wants to talk to you this morning. God wants you to get along with him. He wants you to listen. He wants your heart. 
And he wants you to change your mind. He wants you to know just how valuable and how worthy and how wonderful things you are. Read the first couple chapters of Ephesians. It mentions 14 different things that God says about you being being loved and being chosen and being adopted. And you're you're awesome this morning, God thinks. But you know what? We don't love him when God has poured such a great grace on us and we're just going the other direction. I had church, there's 101 excuses, isn't there? Our minds are full of them. I asked so many of you, have you read your Bible this week? And I just get, nah. I just think, man, if you knew how much God loved you, if you really knew, if you really knew, if you were really listening, it, you'd want to spend hours in the Word of God. There's some days where I don't even want to put it down. Because God's speaking, and I want to listen. And yeah, I got a million and one things to do, but nothing's more important than getting alone with the Father. Because when I'm alone with him, it's like your kids. You know, parents who have kids, if your kids are away, right? Your kids are away. You got grown kids, kids are away. You know that when your kid comes calling, how do you feel? Right? Pretty good, right? Corey, can I share for a second? Okay. It's on to Corey this morning. This is the best example I can give. The best example of this. You know that Corey's married to John, and John is out on the boat working full time. He's a hardworking guy, and they have little John. And little John spends, when John's on a boat, he spends most of the time with his mom. But Corey so desperately wants little John. So she, she prays for that. She prays for time with little John. Yesterday, little John was just, for whatever reason, he wanted Corey. So for the first time ever, right? John's mom calls Corey and says, little John just wants to spend time with you. Can you come get him? Or can I drop him off? Look at her glowing. She couldn't even get the words out this morning. She's choked up. Little John shows up. She hugs him. She loves him. She says, oh, I love you, little John. And you know what? He feels incredibly loved. But Corey's like on fire. This is the greatest thing. My, my, my son, he's home. I'm loving him. And she brings him to church this morning because he's with her in church. He's like fired up. He's excited. And, and you know what it is? She wants what's best for him. She just wants to spend time with him and love him. That's what God is with us. God just wants to spend time with you and love you. And when you're away, because you're not praying, you're not in the word, you're not doing the right thing, God's heart is wrenched. God is burdened. Anytime in the Bible that God's people went and did the wrong thing, you could see how it affected God. That's what love is this morning. Love is is wanting, wanting more than anything to be with him. Do you love God that way this morning? Do you love God that way this morning? Our strength. It's our heart. There it is, God. My soul, I'm caring for it. I'm taking care of it. My mind, I'm renewing it. I'm in the word. I'm listening. I'm spending time with him. My strength, say, here I am, God, use me. Here I am, God, use me. I can quote you a dozen examples in scripture. Remember, like, here I am, use me. God comes calling, here I am, God, speak. Our strength is where I use everything that he's given me to serve him, to say, you know what, God, here I am, and I want to serve the kingdom, and I want to serve others, and this is why Jesus says to love others. To love others. Listen to this. I'm going to share Jesus' parable with you this morning. Luke 10, 25 to 37. Another lawyer pops up. Behold, a lawyer stood and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. He said to him, you've answered correctly. Go and do this and you'll live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? Jesus then tells the story. A man was going down to Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers. who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by a chance, a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. 
So likewise, a Levite came to him to the place he saw him, and he passed on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, had compassion on him. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring oil and wine. And when he set him on his own animal and brought him to the inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed mercy. And Jesus said, You go and do likewise. Loving God with all our strength and loving our neighbors as ourselves includes a couple things. One, the priest. Now, the priest could have been coming from his priestly duties, and he could have saw the man bloody and beaten on the road and just decided he didn't want to be unclean if he would have touched him, he would have been unclean for a week, and that would have been a problem. So, so maybe the priest had a good reason. But God said, the problem is you neglect justice and mercy. The priest should have stopped. Levite, same thing. Probably on his way, doing business, whatever it is. Whatever it is, the two religious guys in this story, the two, the two Christians, I'm going to say Christians, I'm going to talk about church, so you know where I'm going with this. The guys that, that, that should have loved like God are the ones who just walked past and said, not, not my problem. They ignored it. They didn't they want nothing to do with it. The Samaritan, which is Samaritan today, would technically be the bad guy. It'd be the, the guy that nobody likes. The Samaritans and the Jews really had a racial problem, a divide. They, just, they did not like the Samaritans. Just, it was bad. He stopped, and he had compassion on the guy. And he uses what he has. So first off, here's, here's what loving others looks like and loving God. He cared. The Samaritan just cared. He saw the guy beaten and bloody on the side of the road, and he took time out of his day to just care, to show up and say, I'll you do something about that. We have to care about people. We have to care about the condition of our community. We, the followers of Christ in this building, have to look at CK or the tri-state area and say, how can I care about those around me? What can we do to meet the needs of people and to love them? He got involved. He could have been like, not my problem. How many of us, we see that? We see a homeless guy on a corner. We see something or somebody asking you to do something, and, and you see it, you're like, that's not my problem. The Samaritan could have done that, but he didn't. He saw the man, he stopped. He got down, and he did something about it. Not only did he care, but he got involved in this guy's situation. Now, this was a risky business because the road they were traveling here, there had been other robbers and other bad guys. I mean, the Samaritan was really risking his life in a way to go and do this, but he didn't because he cared, he got involved. And then, you know, the third thing he did is he did what he could. He gets down from his animal. He opens up his bag. He's got oil and wine and bandages. And whatever he did, he gets down. And he just, he just loves this guy who he doesn't know. Never met him before. He sees the need. He gets down and does something about it. He uses what he has. And then what he does, he assumes responsibility for the guy. Because then he puts the guy on the animal, he picks him up, he takes him to the inn, tells the innkeeper, guess what? You take care of him, and if there's any extra expenses, when I come back, I'm going to pay you back. And this is what Jesus said, that's what loving your neighbor looks like. To look into CK and say, you know what? I want to love God. So the first thing I want to do is I want to have a heart, mind, and soul that just loves him completely. Nothing between me and him. I'm loving God with everything. I'm praying. I'm worshiping. I'm getting in the word. I'm doing my best to walk in holiness and walk like Jesus. I'm just loving God with everything that I have. And then I want to love others. I want to look at you and I want to look at you and say, what can I do in my community and the people around me to care and make a difference? What can we do to use what we have to not only say we love Canova, because if you don't know this, our ministry in the Canova is hashtag love Canova, and we don't want hashtag love Canova just to be a cool little hashtag, something that we put on t-shirts and websites, but we have chosen to love our community. How do we do that? The first thing we're doing now is the food pantry. I mean, it's food pantry. I want to tell you this one. This was like a, I was, God... Here's how we know he loves me. God does this. Friday morning I got up. It was pantry day. Pantry day was supposed to be last week, but because the weather was horrible, we bumped it over to this Friday. Well, I got up Friday morning, and guess who's got to go take the trailer, load the food at the warehouse, and do everything? By myself. I'm talking 50 boxes that weigh 50 pounds apiece, along with a whole pallet of frozen fruits and canned goods and everything else. I had to go to the dock and one by one put all that in the trailer and... I'm going to tell you, Earl will tell you, he goes with me when he's feeling good. No, Earl, you're, you're covered, brother. He's healing. It's hard work. 
So I get up, I get up Friday morning, and I'm just praying, like, God, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I need that, you know, that strength, like, we, eagle's wings, like, God, I need to lift me up, like, God, I'm about to wear myself out this morning, I need your help. And you know what I heard that voice say? Don't worry about it. Now, when I go to the food bank, ask girl, very rarely at the food bank does anybody help us load our stuff. We're responsible for loading our own trailer. But the minute I get there, two guys come and say, hey, we're going to load the trailer for you. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I was like, I was, I was, I was weeping. At it. I'm like, God, you were so good. Well, then we get back here, and I got Jessica with me, and we got to unload the trailer. So it's not over at the food bank. It's got to come back here. We're unloading the trailer, and I'm like, yeah, man, it's going to take forever. What are we going to do? Because you know, Jessica does not like 50-pound boxes. Well, she's a girl. I get that. <laughs> Guess what? Our neighbor who we love loves us in return. Connie comes over, and Connie starts unloading the trailer. And I'm like, Connie, don't hurt yourself. Those are 50-pound boxes. And she, like a beast, is picking up those boxes and throwing them on the thing. Like, I'm like, whoa, God, go Connie. <laughs> John, I'm telling you, your mom, don't mess with her. <laughs> don't mess with Connie. But you know what? If I didn't take time to pray that morning and seek God and say, God, I just need you, I don't think I would have had all that happen. I didn't think it would happen. And then we got Donnie back here. Donnie's visiting this morning. Donnie just popped up at the pantry last morning. He kind of knows Earl, but Donnie then comes by, and Donnie's just carrying box after box of cars and loading cars and loading people, loving people he doesn't even know. He's, you know, this kind of stuff. So I'm like, you got to come to church on Sunday, brother, because we love you. <laughs> like, that's, that's what God does. Like, loving others brings a blessing. We, this year, want to ask ourselves, how can we love our community better? The pantry is wonderful, and I love doing the pantry work, but I have to believe there's something else we could do. And I want us to start praying for that. How else could we get connected in our community so that when we say we love Canova, we're showing that in action. Love is an action verb. But that won't start this morning until you, church. You got to surrender to God. It's time for some of you just to get converted this morning. It's time for some of you this morning to turn your hearts over your mind and your soul. It's time for you to stop running. It's time for you to realize that God loves you so much and he wants a relationship with you. All you have to do is repent. Place your faith in Jesus. And then you can say, Father, teach me how to love you. That's one thing I love about marriage because if you're married for a long time, you grow apart a little bit. You grow up. Like, Rami and I are not the same people we were when we were 17. Like, we've matured and grown. So there's times I had to sit my wife down and just say, how am I loving you lately? Do you feel loved? And there's times she looks at me and says, you know what, mister? No, I don't. I'm like, oh. Because I have not been investing the time that I should into our relationship. Maybe this morning you need to go to God and say, God, how am I loving you? And if God points out an area in your life that's getting in the way of you loving him, then I would leave that at the altar this morning. Amen? Let's pray. No. Okay, girls, sit down. We're going we're gonna to sing a couple songs this morning. And normally I stop the message here and I pray for you. But I don't want to pray for you. I want you to pray this morning. I want you to take the next five to ten minutes and I want you just to tell God how much you love him. I want you to thank God for loving you. Give him some praise. Give him some praise. If you feel loved by God and you know he loves you, tell him this morning how grateful you are. If you feel like you're a little bit away from God this morning, just turn back. Just turn back. Don't be one of those stiff-necked people, as the Old Testament says. Turn back. Take the next five to ten minutes and just, just connect with God. And maybe this morning, here's maybe this morning you're not sure what to pray. You know what you do? Ask the Holy Spirit to take care of that. The Bible promises that in our weakness, he'll pray for us. But I want you to take the next few moments. I want you to connect with God. Because church, 
if we don't love him with everything we have, we're not going to get anything else right. We're not going to get anything else right. Everything I talk about, evangelism and all that stuff, all that stems from loving God. This morning, maybe it's some sin in your life you need to repent. Know that he'll forgive. Maybe it's honor, maybe it's dedication, maybe it's sacrifice, maybe it's something this morning. If we're honest, and I'll be honest with you as your pastor, there's times where I need to pray and say, God, I've been loving you the way I should, but I want to. Let's pray.